is Without Bias, right around Australia. Jack Heron and Andrew Holmes with you. Lovely to have your company, wherever you might be listening. And we did say that we're going to be joined in the studio by one of the biggest names in the sport to have ever, ever stepped on the green. And he's here with us this morning and he has abided by the rule, of course, that <laughs> catering is a requirement and he has done so as well. I think when we talk bowls, Andrew, and we speak to the general public and we speak to those who are very familiar with the sport and those who are perhaps a little bit more unfamiliar with the sport. This one name resonates. This one name sounds out throughout and everyone pretty much knows who this man is. Well, when I first started with the sport of bowls, Jack, um, and I sort of uh, shared my uh, my knowledge of the sport with friends and family, they said, let me know when you meet two people. <laughs> one of them was Rob Perella, and one of them was this next gentleman who's joined us in the studio. And the ironic thing about both of them is that they are Commonwealth Games gold medalists. So uh, the actual elite level of our sport of uh, lawn bowls is, is is where people know these names from. And uh, I'll let you introduce our, our, our guest. And looking forward to introducing him as well. Looking forward to having a chat. We pretty much earmarked this one right from the start. It's taken us almost a year to get him <laughs> in the studio. So we're working towards these big name guests. His name is Calvin Kirko, an absolute champion of the sport. And now very much involved in the high performance aspect. So Calvin, good morning and thank you for your time. Great, great to be here. Now, let's start with the training camp. We'll work towards your own stuff a little bit later on because there's a lot that we need to talk about there. But training camp in Melbourne this week, obviously looking towards the road to Glasgow, and we'll do a little bit of that with you later on with your Commonwealth Games. But as far as the camp goes, it seems from everyone that we've spoken to, and we're going to speak to a few more people on the show this morning, seems like it was an overwhelming success. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Uh, I mean, we've tried to replicate uh, the Glasgow conditions which uh, the Commonwealth Games team will face uh, in 12 months' time, I guess. So I guess that you know, trying to build on a green that's very slow, uh, conditions that are not Australian conditions. So obviously we've slowed the green down. It's been watered every night. Uh, it's something that the players aren't used to playing on. So basically we've tried to formulate something which they will compete and hope, hopefully win gold medals uh, in Scotland in 12 months. So I think that's what we've got. We've got something very close to, if not exactly what they'll be on, as close as we can go. It's a mighty effort in itself to get everyone in the same place at the same time. We know, obviously, with our bowlers that they're semi-professional. Some of them still obviously have full-time jobs and obligations whether it's work or family or otherwise that they need to take care of so to get everyone in Melbourne that in itself is a massive exercise. Yeah absolutely and I mean it's formulated right through with the high performance squad and Steve Glasson is the national coach I mean he coordinates it all uh, works with the players arranges training sessions prior to even coming here to you know the national trial as such so I think it's it's something that's uh, gone a long way I think Steve Glasson's done a terrific job in getting the players together I think you know he wants to take you know the Australian team to the next level obviously a very successful world championships in Adelaide last year uh, and he wants to build on that and and I think uh, it's obviously a lot harder to to win overseas uh, Certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, I guess the Australian bowls team probably hasn't had the success, of course. So he wants to go that next level and win gold medals overseas. And uh, he's got a lot on his shoulders as well. And the challenge is, Kelvin, um, because we've spoken to Steve about it in the past, is that history and records and uh, and, uh, people's CVs count for little when you are absolutely identifying horses for courses to take overseas to uh, to compete at Commonwealth Games. And there's a lot of players within our squad who, who as we all know, are now, you know, um, world championship gold medalists. But there's going to be some people who are who are more adept and more suitable to the conditions who may not have the CVs of some of the best bowlers in the country. And that's really important to find those people and send the right people overseas, isn't it? Yes, definitely. It's horses for courses. And I think, uh, you know, the recent world championships in Adelaide, uh, you know, we picked players for fast greens uh you know we look at that team now they are the the world champions they all went away with gold medals but how many of those players will go on to play in scotland because at the same time we're picking horses for courses uh we're going to play on very slow greens we're going to play in the rain we're going to have a lot of wind these things didn't happen in Adelaide. we had fast greens with a bit of wind of course but we're going to have slow mushy green grass <laughs> greens which uh, are going to run over the shop a bit they're not going to be as level as what the players are used to playing on you know we're playing on billiard table surfaces here mm. going to get over there we're going to have ant molds uh, you know ant hills as such but it's going to be very tricky and, and and that's going to mentally knock some of our better players around they're not going to believe some of the shots that some of these other countries are going to come you know with wicks and and lucky shots you would say you know 10 foot heavy and coming off a bowl and getting a lucky shot you don't get those results here in Australia on the fast greens your bad bowls run away so bad bad bowls can become good bowls in Scotland 
take Scotland out of the equation in terms of the country playing on their own home digs in uh, in July of next year. What sort of other countries go to the lengths that Australia go to to prepare a squad for conditions such as that? Obviously, with great support from Bowls Australia, um, the team's been able to travel to uh, what is the upcoming Eight Nations event as further training and further um, further acclimatise acclimatisation to the conditions. But what sort of other countries go through the same process? Well, you know, I think uh, I know New Zealand. They've been looking for you know like someone to to go the next step over there. I, I know they've prepared uh, very slow greens as well over there. They had a disappointing world bowls i guess they want to go to the next level i know south africa are going to be very competitive in scotland because they have very slow greens uh you know throw in england scotland ireland and wales they are going to be the dominant countries they did struggle at world bowls on fast greens i think scotland's probably one of the outstanding countries where they did come away with some some medals of course scotland playing in scotland they're yeah. playing on their own home conditions, what they're used to seven days a week, where they play their club championships, district and, and national titles on. So they've played many, many bowls on their natural conditions. It is a big advantage. Uh, they're going to be very hard to beat over there. But, you know, I guess Malaysia, uh, they've come a long way in the last 10 years. They want to go good. Um, countries like Canada, I know, you know, they play on very slow greens. I know they're looking to... Um, go better so you know every country is going to be in a, a much better chance in Scotland because it's going to be a greater equal playing field for everyone that voice you can hear is Calvin Kirko one of the legends of the sport Calvin we've had enough of talking about everyone else now we've done that it's <laughs> time to talk a little bit about you and we're going to do so after the break so if you could stick around Calvin Kirko is our special guest here on Without Bias and after the break we're going to talk a little bit about Calvin's own Commonwealth gold memories right around Australia great to have your company We'll be back shortly with more here on Without Bias. Here we go. From the wide outdoors to the great indoors, this is Without Bias with Jack Hebron and Barry Lester. Yes, it is Without Bias right around Australia. We're joined in the studio and we love studio guests. Anytime that we can get someone in the studio, Andrew, it just well, brightens up our morning a little bit as well. It's not that we don't enjoy each other's company, but it's nice to have someone in as a third wheel well, sort of arrangement. some people who actually brighten up your morning. Then there's some people who come in and actually give it just the absolute maximum ray of sunshine, which this man's done this morning. And we're on our best performance. We're on our A game because yep. Calvin Kirko is our special guest in the studio. Calvin, let's talk about Commonwealth Games. Let's not talk about the Commonwealth Games that you didn't quite make it to at the time, <laughs> even though we're talking about that off the break <laughs> during the ad break. But let's... Let's talk, let's, before we go to Manchester and Melbourne, let's go back a step further and sort of how it all started in the sport for you because it's been one hell of a journey. The fact that you're not only a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, but not many people can say Commonwealth Games gold medalist, now selector and author as well. So not many say, people can yeah. say that. Take us back to where the journey for bowls started. Yeah, listen, I think it all started uh, when I was sort of 12 years of age. I had a, I, I, I guess I, I lived in the country, Kingaroy, uh, Sir Joe Bielke Peterson's country, yes. uh, for the ones that don't know. But, uh, yeah, my parents owned a, f a, f a peanut farm, you would say. I come down with an illness one night, uh, and that was basically why I took up bowls. I'd become paralysed overnight, spent, uh, you know, 12 weeks in, a, in uh, intensive care, another eight months in hospital, and then basically uh, two years in a wheelchair. And from this stage, um, my parents took me down to have a game of bowls. I couldn't play cricket, football, those more contact sorts of sports. So they just wanted to get me out and about, yep. and I basically started from a wheelchair on a bowling green. So I was about 13 years of age at that stage, and uh, all sort of kicked along from there. I got better and better as we went. Now, this is back in a time where, obviously, now we can go to any club around Australia on a weekend and see youngsters competing. But back then, 
it wasn't so common, was it, for someone to be 12, 13 years old competing against adults. It was almost frowned upon at some clubs. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was just no young ones. I know Steve Glasson, like we said, is, who's the national coach at the present time, he started, I think, around the 13 age. Uh, there was only really him, myself, I think Cameron Curtis at the time. There was just really no juniors. I mean, there wasn't juniors in bowls. I mean, they all had the brown shoes, I guess, <laughs> back those days as well. You don't see that now. No. But it's obviously more colour and things. You know, the game's gone forward and... Uh, I think, uh, you know, to come through where there was no juniors in the sport, to see how many juniors we've got now across the country has really been an inspiration as well. So I think, you know, Bowles was there. I, I grabbed the opportunity. I got selected to play uh, for Queensland when I was 18 years of age. And at that time, I think I was the youngest person to ever re represent a state team in Australia. Uh, but now you see that getting smashed. You know, you've got 14 and 15-year-olds obviously playing uh, state bowls. So... It's really turned around. Even representing Queensland at 18, was Commonwealth Games and gold medals and all that sort of stuff, was that even in your thinking at that stage? No, definitely not. I mean, it was just an honour to, to get selected for Queensland. And uh, as I went on and a couple of good years in the state team, uh, you know, the Australian selectors at the time, I guess, uh, seen me potentially getting better and better. And I, and I was starting to get keener and keener, as you, as you do. And uh felt that, well, you know, there's something here for me. So, you know, I started practicing more and, and improving my game and getting better and better. And then I started, you know, putting down goals and those goals were to possibly make an Australian squad and that happened and then to obviously play for Australia and then to go right through and win a gold medal in the men's singles in Melbourne, you know, in front of a, a huge crowd in 206. Well, there's nothing that, you know, you can achieve better, I feel, to win a gold medal in your own country. So it was a dream come through. I suppose, Kelvin, the you know the message that is currently in the marketplace in terms of um, in terms of participation is um, the disability um, team that we are sending to Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games and and um, people probably less fortunate than yourself who, who who don't get that recovery that you've done from your condition. But the element of being able to to play with such a condition and you know you are still affected minorly by it today and you play with a with a stick um, out there. It, yeah. The the whole element of being able to get to that absolute elite level is is something that um is probably unknown throughout the ages and you know throughout the generations but the ability that the bowls provides for uh, for people who are who are suffering from from a uh, a condition is um is so important to uh, to give that message throughout the you know the the ages Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've just recently had 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 the trials in Melbourne for you know for the for the disability, uh, and they've been outstanding. Some of those mm. players, you know, whether they've got a wooden leg, or you know, if, you know, something there somewhere that's an issue, um, they can go on and represent their country now and have the opportunity to win a gold medal as well. So you know, they're marvelous opportunities um, for some of those players. That voice you can hear is Calvin Kirko, right around Australia on Without Bias, Calvin. Talk to us about 2006. So I have the good fortune just about every week of sitting here with Barry Lester. I, I say just about every week. I can't guarantee that he's here every weekend, but he's and he's not here. He's obviously training at the moment. Seems so less frequent than more frequent at the moment. We love having his company all the same. We won't talk about his recent photo shoot as well. We'll just get to that at another day perhaps. But I, I often pick his brain about the Commonwealth Games, and I quite often ask him about his memories. I quite often ask him about the things that he'll never forget, the things that he'll cherish, be able to tell the grandkids, etc., etc., 2006, winning a gold medal in front of a home crowd. There's an aspect of winning that I'm going to ask you about very shortly, but the fact of A, being able to play in front of that home crowd, and then B, being able to stand on top of the dais with a gold medal in your hand in front of a, a proud nation, what was that like for you? Oh, it's, like I said, it was an absolute honour, a thrill. Uh, it was just a, you know the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, and I think to do it with the other Australian team members at the time was also a fantastic uh, part of it. Uh, everyone in the team except uh, one of the players walked away with a with a medal. Yep. We we had a it's the most successful Commonwealth Games team uh, that had ever won before as well. So I think you know just to see my other team members, uh, you know the men's triples, you know the ladies triples, the the men's pairs got a bronze I think which Barry Lester was involved with. I mean to see them all win medals, but then to come away and win a gold medal on the last day of the bowls event. Uh, which was a perfect night, really. It was still calm, capacity crowd, you would say. And and even to have the support from, I guess, um, being part of the Commonwealth Games team with the other sports that are involved as well. I know some of the hockey players and the boxing members of yep. the Australian team, you know, although they're cheering along a lawn bowler, I mean, that just doesn't happen. So, you know, it was terrific to go back, you know, back to into camp as such um, after winning that night and have 
other elite players recognise the sport of bowls as well. So obviously he celebrated very long and hard after standing up on the <laughs> dice and getting that gold medal. <laughs> now, that's exactly what I want to ask you now, Kelvin, in terms of that celebration. And uh, for people who, who ah, may yes. not know a lot about bowls, but they will know a lot about your antics post that 2006 gold medal win. There was a uh, an action of uh, ripping your shirt open uh, on the green after uh, after finally winning that match. What uh, was that a preempted manoeuvre if you were going to win the <laughs> final, or was oh. it a spur of the moment spontaneous reaction that uh, oh. has now become folklore? No, it was a spur of the moment thing, but it does go back. There is a little bit of a story to it. I mean, um, I don't know whether Barry Lester can remember this, but uh, going back, they used to have the, the Grand Prix events, and there was a Grand Prix event at Helensvale, and he was playing with Nathan Rice at the time. Uh, he played me and uh, Brett Dupre in the final of that pairs tournament there, yep. and you know, the Grand Prix events were leading up to Australian team selections. And what happened was uh, Barry and Nathan knocked us off in the in the final. I think it was a last bowl job. Nathan Rice trailed the jack and uh, Barry Lester come down the green. He actually just lifted his shirt, raised his shirt slightly <laughs> and showed his little six-pack he had. Barry, and, yeah. Yeah, you know. The way. probably just had a little spray tan to go with yeah, it as well. well that's yeah. it. And I said, Barry, mate, you know, congratulations. Well done. And I did say to him, I said, mate, if I win a Commonwealth Games gold medal in Melbourne, mate, I'll rip the shirt off. <laughs> but from that day, from that day, I'd never, ever entered my mind ever again. Um, I think it was just the absolute thrill and excitement to win such a close match with Robert Wheel. And basically one set all, one end all, basically come to the last bowl. You know, nothing better to to actually win in front of a capacity crowd and rip the shirt off and away we went. <laughs> I so love it. it I love it. Fantastic feeling. Shades of Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania yeah. just standing or there Andrew tearing Illy. it off. It was, or Andrew Illy, of course. <laughs> Before we let you go as well, I guess the final thing that we touched on there was author. The book Rolled Gold was, was a fantastic read. What, I guess, compelled you to do that? The fact that, was it a bit of a, I guess, putting it all down and putting all of your thoughts and your whole life story down onto paper? And was it was it a soothing and cleansing sort of experience for you? Yeah, listen, it was great just to go back into the old, into the, into the older days. I mean, uh, just, just the way I took up the game of bowls, I guess, with my illness and then to obviously go on and, and win that gold medal in Melbourne, I think, to put it all together in a bit of a story and in a bit of a book uh, for people to read. Because there was a lot of people that didn't know why I used mm. a walking stick when I bowled and why I had foot drop and how it happened and when it happened and why it happened. So everyone I know that's gone out and, and read the book, they've all come up to me and said, well, you know, it's fantastic. Read. Well, I didn't know that. So, I mean, it's something I've got for, to cherish for the rest of my life. Uh, whether I do a roll gold edition book too, I don't know. <laughs> Stay I tuned. Say, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's been a top seller, but it's been <laughs> terrific. And a lot of people have really enjoyed it. And I've got the memories to go with it. So it's been terrific. Just before we do let you go, um, just some wisdom from you in terms of now you're a, a um, national selector with the Australian team under Steve Glasson. Uh, we've got some really young players in that squad at the moment. We've got a two-time Australian Open winner in Lisa Phillips, who's, uh, who's 19, 20 years of age. Dylan Fisher's in the same boat. You can reach the pinnacle of the sport at a very young age now, given the right commitment and the right discipline to actually work through the grades and to get to that level. Anyone out there who is who is taking it up or at a very young age, what what is your your overarching philosophy in uh, in terms of success to uh, you know to get to the point where you're you know club, state, national, and international representation? Well, I really think it uh, it all begins with uh, you know commitment, dedication. You only get. You know, you only achieve the greatest goals by as much as you put back into it. So it's, uh, yeah, perfect practice makes champions. So, you know, I think you just got to go out there, set your, set your goals. I'm a great believer of setting goals, knocking them over one by one and always have a goal there that's uh, probably in the long range that you want to achieve. Speaking of setting goals, we set a goal a while ago that we wanted Calvin Kirko, not only on the show, you have been on the show before, in this very studio, yep. and we've done that now. It's taken us a year, but we got there in the end. Kelvin, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Really, really honoured that you could come by and have a chat to us. And you've done some fantastic things on the green, still doing some really good things, but now doing some great things as well with our Jackaroo squad as well, and hopefully the youngsters coming through. The next batch in the future looks very, very bright. Enjoy the trip back, and thank you for joining us this morning. Pleasure. Thank you very much.